I want to go ahead and bring Monica Willard to the screen. Monica. Monica, are you here? Thank you. Can you I get to the screen? Hi. Hello. Mommy, you were great. Thank you. She was absolutely awesome. Monica, I would love for you, if you will, if you can introduce our next two speakers. Oh. I would love for you to do that because they, I, I have not had an opportunity to meet them yet. And I want to make sure that they receive the, pro the proper welcome to the stage. I am thrilled to be asked to do that. Thank you so much. Um, Audrey Kitagawa is not only the chair of the Parliament of the World's Religions, um, a leader of a spiritual family with followers around the world, um, she is a uh, representative for the United Religions Initiative to the UN. She has worked in the Office for Children in Armed Conflict at the UN. And she has a heart as big as the one, maybe bigger than that's behind Fumi's head. I mean, her heart just reaches out to the world. And Audrey can speak on any topic, but this is a week that has been amazing because she has helped actually create history by looking back at history. Um, and her team made the most amazing video um, to honor the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so I pass the floor over to Audrey Kitagawa and she will be followed, but wait, before I start, she will be followed by Kekosha Basu, um, who's um, on the line. I don't see her name, but I know she's here. And Kekisha has won uh, the Youth Peace Award. She has been, a, she just won the first ever uh, Youth Award uh, honored named after George Schultz and Mikhail Gorbachev for her work on nuclear weapons. And she spreads love and peace and joy to youth and to people of all ages. So these are two people that you're going to hear next. Thank you so much for joining us on this, especially on August the 9th, the day we just did lessons from Nagasaki. It's also the day for the indigenous peoples at the UN. And this day is uniting so many causes and so many people. Thank you, Dr. Marty. Welcome, Audrey. Welcome, Kekisha. Thank you so much, Monica, for your introduction. And I really want to share how very privileged I feel to share on this special day, Black Sun Day. And this is a day that calls for all people of all backgrounds to really unite for justice and healing and to create a lasting legacy for those who have lost their lives to senseless violence and to commit to change the culture that has permitted it. So this is a very important day. And apropos to this commemorative day of senseless violence, we are also in remembrance that on August 9th, 75 years ago, a nuclear bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, as Monica has mentioned, as well as Funmi. And three days earlier, a nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Hiroshima is remembered as the historic moment when this heinous nuclear weapon was first used, and Nagasaki is remembered for the historic moment as the last time a nuclear bomb was used. Both bombs were dropped on innocent civilians and thousands of people lost their lives, and well over half a million in the years that followed. Many of the survivors of the bombings called Hibaksha have dedicated their lives to tell the stories of their suffering and pain at having lost their loved ones, of having to endure their own pain and suffering from the effects of the radiation on their health and the utter misery which these bombs rained down on their lives. 36 years ago in 1986 in Iceland, Presidents Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev had a meeting to enter into negotiations that came very close to having the entire nuclear arsenal dismantled. The meeting explored the possibility of limiting each country's strategic nuclear weapons to create momentum in the ongoing arms control negotiations. And this meeting called the Reykjavik Summit, which almost resulted in a sweeping nuclear arms control agreement in which the nuclear weapons of both countries would be dismantled. 
However, no agreement was reached and many historians and government officials, including Mikhail Gorbachev himself, later considered this meeting a turning point in the Cold War. What prevented such an agreement was the space-based missile defense system known as the Strategic Defense Initiative under consideration at that time by the United States. And President Reagan refused to limit the Strategic Defense Initiative research and technology to a laboratory. So President Gorbachev, however, would not accept anything less than a ban on missile testing in space Despite the failure to reach an agreement on that issue, both sides, though initially disappointed, ultimately felt that the meeting was a success and it opened the way for further progress for reduction in each country's respective nuclear arsenal. So nuclear arsenal now is down to 14,000 nuclear warheads, which was originally 70,000 nuclear warheads during the Cold War buildup. It was also the first time in history that the Soviet Union had ever let another country become involved in human rights issues in the USSR. We had a world premiere, as Monica mentioned, of a film that was made to commemorate this 75th anniversary of the bombings. And former Soviet Union President Mikhail Gorbachev is a participant in this video as well as former Secretary of State George Shultz, who is now 100 years old. The fact that these two giants of history participated in the making of this film to address their roles in nuclear weapons ab abolition 36 years after their historic Iceland summit, where they saw the promised land but could not reach it, signifies their continued commitment to the abolition of nuclear weapons. As there are now nine nuclear weapon countries since the first bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, just the other day there was a front page article in the New York Times that Saudi Arabia may be enriching nuclear weapons grade fuel with the help of China, which is one of the nine nuclear weapon countries. We really need to stop the further expansion of nuclear weapon countries. And the four co-sponsoring interfaith organizations of this historic commemorative video and the Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord are the Parliament of the World's Religions, Religions for Peace, United Religions Initiative, and the Charter for Compassion. These are four of the largest interfaith organizations in the United States. The Hiroshima Nagasaki Accord is also the first time that these four organizations have joined together to create this accord, which has nine calls to action for a broad, from a broad cross section of civil society participants to mobilize and get behind the abolition of nuclear weapons. The specific terms of this accord can be found on each of the named co-sponsoring organizations. And the link to this historic video can also be attained through the SIGN Network, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. The four co-sponsoring interfaith organizations also co-sponsored this commemorative historic video. And this video had its world premiere on August 6th at the same time that the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. What is significant about the four largest interfaith organizations coming together demonstrates this important paradigm of cooperative engagement, which we must continue to manifest as a way forward in being able to reach mutual goals for the betterment of humanity. As more than 80% of the world's population are adherents to some faith or religious tradition. When the leaders of these organizations demonstrate the coming together, the joining of hands to work harmoniously and cooperatively together, we can reach the promised land because our ethical, moral, and spiritual teachings of nonviolence, love, and caring for each other and the earth demonstrates the maturity of the change of the culture of insularity to the dilation of our global lens of mutual engagement 
to address solutions to major global challenges, of which abolishing nuclear weapons is a major global existential threat. As today's broadcast is also about healing, I wanted to say this beautiful prayer that I heard for the very first time yesterday on a broadcast on the nuclear issue written by a very dear friend of mine, Jonathan Granoff. He is the president of the Global Security Institute, an organization committed to the abolition of all nuclear weapons. Jonathan is a highly spiritual man with a very well-developed sense of values and ethics. And he also happens to be observing this uh, broadcast today. And may my recitation of his prayer add to the healing of our hearts, minds, and spirit of all those who hear this prayer. That nuclear weapons never be used again, O oh God, bless and guide us to eliminate these devices, the apex of creative evil, and all devices of massive indiscriminate death, please guide us. Each of us came into this world responding to our mother's love. Each came seeking family and love. Each of us became identified with nation, race, gender, religion, and forgot we are one human family, and every person is as precious as we are. But still in the stillness in our hearts remains a light of the soul, seeking, resonating, and longing for that love that brought us here into this world. That love awakens and informs our universal humanity and awakens hearts without borders. Intelligence has given us insights into the wondrous secrets of matter, energy, space, and time. Fear, ignorance, arrogance, pride, hatred, and differences have led us to use these insights to create devices of incomprehensible power to inflict indescribable horrific suffering. Please, dear Lord of all, creator of every life, every heartbeat, every moment, every leaf, blade of grass, every one of us, and universes and galaxies beyond counting. O oh, glorious source of love and life, forgive us for forgetting you and your blessings. O oh, friend within all friendship, love within all loves, life within all lives, witness of all and everything. Bless us with the wisdom that comes from compassion, such that we will skillfully eliminate these devices of death and use the gift of intelligence to serve, heal, sustain, harmonize, understanding, and glorify you, our humanity, and honor your creation. To end the suffering of poverty, to protect nature, to love one another, remove the ignorance from our hearts, Grant us hearts of gratitude, courage, and love that we will not falter in bringing peace, justice, beauty, and unity to your human family. Help us eliminate these devices of death and the motives from which we create them. Please guide us in beautiful ways of peace such that we can be witnesses of your goodness. Guide us with compassion, kindness, and love that we might become fully human. All praises are yours. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey, for being here with us today. You are so amazing and I cannot wait to, to connect with you. Um, outside of this, I, I hope that you would say yes to that. Um, there are so many things that I would like to speak to you about offline. You are so impressive and it is truly an honor to have you grace our stage today. Well, thank you very much. And to all of our participants and the co-sponsors of this beautiful event. Thank you. Blessings to you. <laughs> thank you, Audrey. Kekisha? Yes, thank you so much uh, for, uh, I feel so privileged to 
be here uh, today on such uh, a day of healing for all. My name is Keksha Vasu. I'm a United Nations human rights champion and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation. And our world has more young people than ever before. 26% of the population are children and 16% are youth. And together we constitute 42% of the world's population. And in developing nations and in least developed countries, children and youth are a majority. And despite our large and increasing numbers, we continue to be marginalized, bereft of opportunities, being victims of bias, inequity, and exploitation. Simply put, we do not have a voice. So through my organization, Green Hope Foundation, I work with the world's most marginalized uh, communities, Syrian refugees, Rohingya refugees, HIV positive young people, and children of prisoners in Nepal and Kenya, those who are living in utter poverty in villages across India and Bangladesh. Most of them have never been to school and for them, survival is all about making it to the next day. And the plight of girls is even worse. Not only are they subjugated by, by centuries of oppressive traditions, they're exploited, abused and trafficked and have literally no freedom to even speak their mind, let alone wear what they want. So we work to empower them using education for sustainable development, providing them with the skills, knowledge, attitudes, values, behaviors required for a sustainable future. And education provides them with the knowledge about their rights and gives them the confidence to demand it, challenging the inequity that oppresses them. But this is not enough. We need more youth representation, especially of those from the global south and those who are from marginalized communities in all aspects of decision making and agenda setting. Here in the West, especially, there is a growing trend of using youth tokenistically as if we are only good for leading protest marches while the decisions that control our future continue to be taken by adults and power brokers in the background. And this must change, but it will not happen on its own. Education, again, holds the key to our empowerment. And only then will we have more young people in parliament, more young women in corporate boards and greater diversity of representation in all systems of governance. COVID-19, the pandemic, has had a more disproportionate effect on children and youth, especially on girls and women. It has affected our job opportunities, access to healthcare and education, and has literally set us back several years. So the process of building back better needs to take this into account to not waste money on building weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, but to reallocate resources to solve the world's most pressing challenges to facilitate creation of local circular economies and provide sustainable pathways of entrepreneurship and employment for young people. In my interactions with children and youth across the world has vindicated my belief that in each and every one of us, there is a change maker. All we need is an opportunity. And with that opportunity, we together can rid the world of hate and violence and create a world that is peaceful, that is sustainable, and that is equitable. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. What a beautiful soul. Thank you so much. We will continue to support the youth because of your message. Thank you.